chest, line up in the front and wait, and then go down together. Good morning, how's everyone doing? You can kind of always tell, I, I think allergies or something kicked in because my voice dropped a little bit, uh, and so it's a little bit deeper today. Um, I don't know, I kind of like it, right? It's a little, a little more bass. Um, but it's always such a joy to share the word of God and uh, just to gather together as a family in Christ. And um, we're continuing to go through the book of Ephesians, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus. And as we continue to go through this book, I hope that what becomes abundantly clear is that for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, our lives are meant to be different. Our lives are meant for something more than this world. Our lives have a purpose, a call that God has placed on each of us by his awesome love and grace. Last week, we talked about the importance of walking in purity, uh, purity in our walk with the Lord. Paul adamantly warned us to avoid sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, crude joking, and anything that might take us away from obedience to God. But however, he also did tell us to avoid these things at all costs, but not just because those actions and behaviors in and of themselves are bad, which they are against God, but everything always tied to the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Remember, in Ephesians chapter 5, it started by letting us know that we ought to imitate God in his love for us. Imitate God in his love. And then it says, walk as beloved children. So let's not forget the context of where we are, that in all the things that Paul is telling us to do, that we need to do, it's with in that umbrella, under that umbrella, that we are beloved children of God. And so it's the relationship with Jesus, the love that we have received, that drives and motivates our obedience. Not just, I want to stop doing bad things because they're bad, and maybe God will love me less if I do too many bad things. Or doing the good things and saying, well, if I just do enough more good things that maybe God will love me more and show me his favor. No, that is not how God works. If you are his beloved child, infinitely he has loved you through the love of Christ. Amen? And so that's what everything here, all the things that he talks about, that's under this understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus. Because we are already beloved, we love. Because we are already called to eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus, we now live for him. And today we're gonna to talk about this aspect of what it means that we are lights meant to shine for God. And so let's look at Ephesians chapter five. We're gonna look at verses seven through 14 together. And this is the word of God. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Speaking of unbelievers. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let's pray together. Dear God, we pray that you would help us to bring all the distractions and the, the, the busyness and, and the things that are going on in our hearts and in our minds before you right now. We place them at your feet, O God. And we pray that your word would give each one of us the encouragement that we need to hear this morning. That you would speak personally to each of us and remind us of who you are, your grace, your love, your plan, your purpose. That whatever we might find ourselves in 
right now in our lives that as your word is spoken, God, that you would speak powerfully through the Holy Spirit, that we'd just be so encouraged and challenged to live our lives for you alone. Thank you, God, that by your grace we can become beloved children of God and that once we are your beloved child, there is nothing that can separate us from your love. And may that motivate us to live our lives in a way that shows who you are, that many more people might experience that love, forgiveness, and grace that only you can give. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so is anyone here afraid of the dark? It's okay. You, I want you to actually see some hands here. Anyone here afraid of the dark? Or, or have you ever been afraid of the dark at some point in your life? Okay. I see some honest people raising their hands. Everyone else, I think you're lying, right? Okay. Um, but I don't judge you. Right? I think... I, I, I've never been a huge fan of the dark, not that I'm a big fraidy cat or anything like that, but have you ever wondered why people are afraid of the dark or maybe just don't like the dark? I think quite simply, when things are dark, what? You cannot see very clearly. And when you can't see clearly, you're kind of left to your own mind and your own thoughts to come up with all sorts of things that might be there. Because you can't see it quite clearly. So there's something that might be there that could harm you. Something that might be there that could be dangerous, that could be no good for you. Something that might be there that could get you. So what is the solution when you don't like the dark, when you're afraid of the dark? All you need is a little light. Maybe you still sleep with a night light of some sort. I know my kids, Caleb and Chloe, they kind of shared a little sound machine, like it makes white noise, but also has a little light, and they still sleep with that little light on. Or maybe we leave the hallway light on, because it's, if we turn it all off, Appa, it's too dark, it's too dark. Light helps us to see more clearly what is around us. So we don't have to be afraid that something is creeping around us or sneaking up on us because light exposes the things around us and helps us to see things for what they truly are. And I think what the Apostle Paul is wanting to tell us as believers of Jesus Christ in this passage that we've just read, that he actually tells us that we are light. And he tells us we need to walk as children of light. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about and, and unravel a little bit together today. What does it mean that we are, are, are children of light? What does it mean that we are light? And what must we, we remember so that we can live our lives faithfully in that way in Christ? There's just two points that I'm going to have for us today. And first is we have to recognize that light shines. Okay, Light shines shines. It's always meant to shine. And secondly, light exposes darkness. Light exposes darkness. So let's start with that first point, that light shines. Verse 7 to 10. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I think it's interesting to see how Paul describes the darkness and the light in this passage. Notice how he doesn't say, well, we were once in the darkness, but now we are in the light. He actually says here that we were darkness, that we were darkness. That's in and of ourselves who we were. We were darkness. And then he follows that up for the believers, telling them that they are no longer darkness, but now they are light in the Lord. Now there is great theological significance in letting us know that we were darkness, but now we are light. That means the very essence of who we are as human beings those who do not know the Lord and those that do. Something happens in us that is not just an outward change or some kind of garb over us, but we become different in our 
essence because we become connected with God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light. Who is light? God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. It's important. If God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, and if through Jesus Christ, when he dies on the cross for our sins, when we place our faith in him, we become united with him in his death and resurrection, when we are one with Christ together, not only with him, but also with the body of believers, we are now in and of ourselves light. So what does it mean that we were darkness? Now, we've touched upon this many times When God created Adam and Eve, everything was good. It was very good. There was no sin in the heart of man. But when they chose Adam and Eve to disobey God, they fell into sin, and sin came into the world and corrupted everything, every fiber of creation. And yet God made a way to reverse the curse of sin, and he would do that through his son, Jesus Christ. But sin has affected our world. Sin has affected humanity. Though we bear God's image, we became enemies of God, deserving his wrath. Remember last week, we talked about the sons of disobedience. That's who we once were. When we're in sin, when we're apart from Christ, we're enemies of God, we're sons of disobedience, and yet God makes a way for us to be forgiven and saved and then to become beloved children of God. And so yes, we were not only in darkness, but we were darkness. But that is no longer who we are when you're forgiven by the grace of God when you've received his love, when you know him as your father in heaven, you are now light. And the only one who can change darkness to light is Jesus Christ. It's through the power of Jesus on the cross in his death and resurrection as the wrath of God was poured out upon him for our sake that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Life. It always points back to Jesus. It always points back to Jesus. Without his sacrifice, without his love, we are still darkness. But by his grace, again, for those who believe, we are now light. And when we are light, it means that we have purpose. Remember the point is that light shines. Light can't help but illuminate. Light can't help but do what it's meant to do, which is to shine. And that is the purpose that God gives to us. And that's why Paul says, walk as children of light. Because though we become light, we still at times as believers struggle. Because we see darkness and there's still some temptation in us to go back to who we once were, to go back to the darkness where sin and the evil one used to operate. And so Paul says, walk as children of light. In verse 7, what does it say? That we would not become partners with those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean exactly? Some people take this and they misapply it and say, okay, well, as Christians, then I can't have any non-Christian friends. Right? Look, look what it says. It says, don't become partners with them. Well, what does that mean? Well, Paul is talking about the fact that, yes, we are in the world, but we are no longer of the world because we're in Christ. We are light now. And so you can't partner with darkness in the way that you live as darkness does, that you act as darkness does, that your purpose is what the darkness has purpose for. Now you might think, well, isn't that so bad to look at people who don't believe in Jesus Christ as darkness? That seems kind of, kind of wrong. And I say, no, this is the reality The reality, remember, again, in last week's passage, the reality that there is wrath coming for the darkness. That God is holy and righteous, and there is a judgment that is coming that God is going to bring when Jesus Christ returns. So we have to shine into the darkness 
and ask of God, pray to God that many more who were once darkness would become light by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We mustn't partner with them in what they do. We have a different purpose. We have a different call. And so here's a question that I want to ask you. Do you find yourself living for God in all that you do? Now, that's a big question. Does God, does your relationship with Jesus factor in to the decisions that you make in your life? Does your relationship with Jesus Christ, does the gospel message of Jesus, that you are a beloved child of his, that you are now light, does that factor in to how you live your life, how you treat other people, what you choose to do, what you choose not to do, what you choose to say, what you choose not to say? Are you living for in your heart the things that are eternal, that last forever in God? Or do you find yourself being wowed by the things of this world, by the fancy and shiny things that this world promises to you? Because the temptation, it, if we all admit it, it's very easy to fall into the darkness again. And Paul says, no, that's not you. Walk as children of light. Verse 9 says this, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And then it says, and try to discern, in verse 10 it says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And I think that this part is essential to our lives, living our life for God. Now I heard it said this way, where salvation is free. All you need to do is receive the gospel message of Jesus and respond in faith and you are forgiven once and for all and you become a child of God. But in the way that you live your life, the sanctification that takes place in your life after you become a believer, that does require some effort. It doesn't mean that you're saving yourself because you're already saved once and for all, but in order to look more like a child of God, it says imitate him. You have to make conscious decisions to not live like the world and for the world and instead to live for God in a way that is pleasing to him. Too many people say, I believe in Jesus, but they don't even take a moment to try to discern if what they're doing is pleasing to God. You know what they'll do instead? They'll try to discern if this is the best thing for them, that if it makes them feel good, if they're passionate about it, if they think logistically it makes the most sense, it's the most logical choice. No, those are not the things that we rely on as we walk as light of God. We say instead, does this please my God? Does this please the Lord? And it does take work. It takes effort to discern. It's much easier to just do what you want. It's much easier to just go with how you feel. It's much easier to go with the majority. Oh, well, culture says everything goes now. The easy way is just to follow along, to be swept up in the current. But no, we are light. Discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And so how do you do that? Right? I can't just say, well, discern what's pleasing to the Lord, and then just leave you there. Because it's like, well, how, how do I do that? Well, what are we doing right now? We're getting into the word of God. We're getting into his story of love and redemption for us. From Genesis to Revelation, God is wanting us to see his amazing love for us and what he wants for us to do with our lives. The heart of God, which we're growing in as believers of Jesus, as beloved children. We want to be like the Father. And so when we imitate God, we need to know more of who he is. And where we're going to find more of who he is is in his word. Amen? Amen. And so as we're here together this morning, every Sunday, we get into the word of God, the precious word of God that he has given to us, that he has preserved over time so that we might have it, know more of who he is, and that we can discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The question that I say you can always ask, does this, what I'm about to do, does this, what I'm about to say, does this, Glorify God. Does it discern, do you discern what is pleasing to God? 
And if the answer to the question, does this please Jesus, does this honor him, is not an emphatic yes, then you take a moment to pray and consider more. And if the answer is a no, or you kind of are on that line where, oh, I'm not sure if this is pleasing to God, you better stop in your tracks and pray and ask of God to give you wisdom and discernment before you move forward. If the answer is no, it does not please God, I don't care how amazing or or how awesome or perfect it seems or how many more pros there are than the cons and the list that you made or even how strongly you feel about it or, 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 or how passionate you are about it, if it does not glorify God, you go the other way. You say, I don't want to have anything to do with something that will take me away from glorifying God with my life. It's not always easy. It's not. But we have to learn how to discern. And we have to learn to take that seriously. Let's stop making decision after decision. Let's stop doing all these different things and saying all these different things without discerning if we're glorifying God. And it doesn't mean that you get stuck and like, oh my gosh, am I glorifying God or not? And now I can't do anything because I'm immobilized. No, it means check your heart, pray, and then go as God leads you. Amen? Learn to choose God at every turn. He loves you. He has a plan for you that's greater than anything that you could ever come up with for your life. It doesn't always mean comfort and everything's always easy, but I promise you that if you learn to discern what glorifies God and you continue to choose on a consistent basis following God, no matter what comes your way, you're going to grow in an understanding of his peace, his love, his joy to live as a beloved child of God. And it will be well worth it, especially into eternity when you get to be with God forever. Second thing is this, light exposes darkness. Verse 11 through 14, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. If you'd like to know where the devil or evil likes to operate and do its thing, it's in the darkness. The devil likes to work in the darkness, in the places that are hidden away, or even when people don't realize that what they're doing is sinful, it's in the shroud of darkness that the devil wants to keep you in. And what light does to this darkness and sin is that it exposes it and it shows it for what it truly is. And oftentimes those who are in darkness or those who are darkness, when the light exposes what it is that does not glorify God, it is not very happy about it. Oftentimes there's an adverse reaction. Hey, what are you doing shining that light? I'm perfectly comfortable living how I want to live, living for myself, for my own pleasures, for the things of this world. What are you doing with that light? And perhaps even already as Christians, when the light exposes darkness that's still, in a, in a sense, for that we struggle with is in us, we don't like that very much either. But imagine not knowing God, not knowing that there's something more to live for, and suddenly there's this bright light that shines. You might think that everyone should say glory, hallelujah, and become light by grace through faith in Jesus. But so often you're going to be met with some kind of terrible reaction to it, because I, I don't want that light. I remember seeing this show where they'd go to hotels and they'd kind of test the cleanliness of hotel rooms and, you know, there was this trick that a lot of hotels used to do where I think they would just have very dim lights in their rooms, right? And the reason for that is not just to have ambiance and, you know, have the environment, but a big part of that was to kind of cover up 
some of the blemishes perhaps that there might be in the room. And if it's not super clean, well, if it's dim lit, then at least you won't be able to see everything. So what they would do is they'd come and they just bring these really bright lamps and the first thing, they just shine it in the room. And boom, already, wow, the room was a different place. There were crevices with a lot of dust and all these kind of things that had to be taken care of. But then they took it another step further. What they do is actually they had those you know, UV black lights, all right? And that's when it got really scary because they'd have everything off and then they'd turn the UV black light on and then you'd see all kinds of weird stains and things all over the carpet and the bed and the pillowcases that might just make you shudder. And just to imagine all the people who had stayed in some of these hotel rooms without even knowing it, just getting in there nice and comfortable, right? Getting into those sheets and into those blankets with all that dirtiness and filth on it, even without knowing. But when you expose those things, you, you realize there are things that need to be taken care of. There are things that need to be cleansed and taken away and, and God is letting us know that every single human being that's born into this world is born with that kind of stain. That there is a dirtiness to us when we are born into this world. Now, I'm not saying that we lack value, okay? So don't hear what I'm not saying. All of us are image bearers of God, valuable to God. The very reason he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. But we are marred by sin. We're under the curse of sin. And there's only one light that ultimately can take away every single blemish. That can take out all the filth and all the dirtiness of sin. And that is the light that is Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. And so he comes and he exposes the light and he gives us opportunity to respond in faith to him. And then if we respond to him in faith, by grace through faith in Jesus, we are not only saved, we are made clean. And as this passage tells us, we go from darkness to light. Jesus exposes things in us, not to put us down, not to condemn us, but again, to give us opportunity for the forgiveness that he makes readily available. But if we are light, we can't help but expose sin. We can't help but expose darkness. And so as we live our lives, we will be in the world as light, and when there's darkness around us, by who we are, the essence of who we are as beloved children of God, as light of the world, lights of God, we're gonna expose darkness. And we talked about when darkness is exposed, they don't, it's not, they're not really gonna like it all the time. But we're not called to be fearful either. And so when we shine light, what is it? Everything that's good and true. So we shine truth, we shine his love, we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. Paul says that some things that the non-believers were doing were too shameful to even talk about. And I think about that idea of, of shame where nowadays we're just so afraid to offend anyone. We're so afraid to confront people. We're so afraid to shine anything, we wanna kind of hide our shine and blend in if, with the darkness if we can so that we don't stick out too much or so that we won't cause too much trouble or, 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 or you know, I don't have to talk about those hard topics because I don't want to look like the bad guy because somehow following Jesus and standing on his word has become synonymous in culture as being backwards or old-fashioned or, or listening to some kind of archaic text. But we are the light if you're a believer of Jesus Christ. We have to learn to speak into those times, even when it's difficult, with truth. And that doesn't mean you go around bashing people over the head with, with, with different laws that God gives. Hey, you're not obeying. Hey, you're not obeying. Let me show you all the ways that you're doing wrong. We are not called to condemn. To shine the light, again, is not to condemn, but it's to give an opportunity for response in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And so in all things, as you walk as children of light, it may be uncomfortable at times 
to talk about how someone is not living in a way that pleases God, but as the opportunity presents itself, I pray that God will empower you to shine brightly in those moments and to trust that God is working through you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We should be exposing darkness. We should be walking in this world and and proclaiming truth wherever we go. It says this in the end of verse 14. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This last part of these verses is likely taken from actually a few parts in the book of Isaiah. And it reminds us that we are light, that we are one with Christ who shines on us, but he shines on us and we reflect who he is because we become his light in the way that we live. So we shine his light, we expose darkness. Why? All to glorify God, not to raise ourselves up or help us to feel elevated spiritually compared to other people. We're not comparing ourselves, we're not elevating ourselves, we want to glorify God. And so we learn to live as children of light, united with Christ, our Savior, the light of the world. Let's live like him. Let's shine for him. Let's expose darkness in a way where people understand and are given the opportunity to respond in faith. Let's shine his light in all that we do. Be discerning. Does this please the Lord? If it's a maybe not, Pray more, go the other way. If it's a yes, even if it's difficult, even if it comes with some discomfort, go with boldness as God leads you. Let us live as walking lights in this world. Let's pray. So I want to take a moment to give you an opportunity to respond in prayer before we get into a time of really worship through communion together this Sunday morning. Have you been living as light in the world? If no one knows that you are a Christian, if no one knows that you're a Christian in your life, you may not be shining in the way that God wants you to shine. But he's calling you right now and he says, walk as children of light, because that is who you are. Every fiber of your being, you are light. You were darkness, but now you are light because of Jesus. Will you choose to shine? You already do, that's what, you're spo- that's what light does. Have you been living in a way that is shining as truth? And that doesn't mean you walk around with a huge Bible everywhere or get all cross necklaces and earrings and try to show in some big way that you're a Christian, but in how you live, how you treat others, are you light in the darkness? Darkness will see, hey, there's something different about this. If you have not been living as light, though you are a believer of Jesus, be encouraged that you can never go back to being darkness again because you're united with Christ in your spirit and who you are. And let that encourage you not to live even more with fervor. Discern ways that are pleasing to God. Can you just take a moment to commit yourself to that before we take communion together? That you would live in such a way where you are an active part of shining in this world. You're an active part of showing Jesus at every step of the way. Let's take a moment to pray, and then I'll close us before we go into time of communion. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you continue to remind us of who we are. We thank you that when we see that we are light, we remember 
you, God, the light of love, who united us to himself, reconciled us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And to continue to mold our hearts, continue to challenge us to live in such a way where many, many more people will come to know this light, that they too might become light through the forgiveness of Christ. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.